just before we start, I wanted to mention that the first segment of this video was recorded 14 months before the last segment. Now, it's not because it took that long to make the hiking staff. In fact, you can do this in a much shorter time. It's more because I just had other projects that would come up and I put this one aside and then come back to it over time. All right, now, one more thing. I would, want you, would like you to watch the video and notice any differences that you might see from the first to the last segment. And if you recognize them, comment on them in the comment section below. All right, let's get started. If you're interested in knowing why I consider the hiking staff an essential piece of outdoor equipment and how you can make one for yourself, keep watching. Virtually every time I go to the woods, I do carry my hiking staff with me. I consider this a critical piece of my equipment. And my reasons for that include things like, well, balance. Having a hiking staff always gives you two points of contact with the ground, and that can be very important when the ground is potentially slippery, either with ice or just with water. I like using it for crossing over the frozen lake during the winter, carrying it like this, because should I happen to go through the ice, having my stick will help prevent me from being submerged under the water. Crossing streams, the stick is very helpful. If it's a fast-moving current, I can use the stick to brace myself against that. Crossing, you can use the stick, I guess, for probing into areas that you can't see. That can be true that for the depth of the snow, moving bushes aside, or even crossing ponds and streams to find out what's in front of you, such as a rock. In my area, it's very hilly and very rocky, so the stick is a great assist for ascending and descending. A hiking staff can help to transfer some of the weight of your backpack off of your legs, hips, and back to your arms and your shoulders. The stick is also useful for a number of other tasks, such as shelter building. I've used my hiking staff as a support for putting up a tarp when there was no trees to attach it to. I've also used it for foraging, where I've attached a Y branch to it and then reached up to branches I couldn't reach with my arms. So what else could it be used for? Well, I guess it could be used for defense against aggressive animals. I suppose you could also attach a knife to the end of it and create a spear. And one last thing that I've used it for is a selfie stick by attaching my Gorilla Pod to the end of it and holding it outwards. So let's start with wood selection. Now I can only speak to the wood that's available here to us in Nova Scotia and what my preferences are. So far and away, the best wood that we have available to us here for a hiking staff is the rock maple or sugar maple. Pound for pound, it is the strongest of the woods we have. That's not to say you couldn't make it from a variety of other woods. This one is made from black cherry. You could also use birch, although maybe not as strong. You could use oak, although quite strong, is very heavy at the same time. You could certainly use aspen, you can certainly use ash, and you can certainly use ironwood. Those are what are available to us here. Okay, let's talk about choosing how long you want your staff to be. So my recommendation is to have something that's at least up to your armpits, but taller is better. Personally, I prefer my stick to be above my chin, and the reason is, if I'm going down an incline, I'm less likely to poke myself under the chin. So I also recommend when you're looking at picking out a stick in the woods that you find something taller than you want it to be when you're finished. Make sure you have enough working room on either end. As the old saying goes, you can always take more wood off, but you can't add it back on after it's cut. Same thing goes for choosing the diameter. I recommend finding something an inch and a half to two inches in diameter. Remember that, of course, once you take the bark off and if it's green wood, once it dries, it's gonna shrink down. And once you're finished shaping and sanding, it's gonna be considerably smaller than, than it was when you started out with. So speaking of choosing woods that are either green or dry, what are the advantages and disadvantages? So if you choose to find a dead standing stick, um, you're going to shorten down the amount of time it takes to finish your product, but at the same time, you're not quite sure until you take the bark off whether it's going to be suitable for your use. You can find a good looking stick like I thought this one was, and turned out afterwards that it was all spalted underneath the bark. Let me show you that. Now, I'll talk it a little later on in the video what I did to remedy that, and actually it turned out to be quite nice looking, but that is spalting you're looking at along its length. So yes, you could do, use a dry stick, but uh, I prefer to cut green sticks. Now, there are a number of factors in cutting green sticks. First off, the best time of year, during the winter. During the winter, the wood is at its driest because of course the sap is not running. It's also easier to see the sticks as there's no foliage to cover them up. Having said that, though, once you get your stick home, it's going to take a bit of time for it to dry. So uh, let's go to the woods and see if we can't find a good sample that we can turn into a hiking staff. 
So this looks like it might be a good candidate for a hiking stick. So what we have is one of those clusters of maple trees together. So there's four of them, as you can see, clustered together. The two in the center are very healthy looking. The two on the outside, well, the one on the right, on the right is dead. And uh, that's what happens when they're crowded out by the larger, more healthier ones. They get the, they compete and get the light nutrients and they crowd out the other ones and the little ones die off. So the one on the left is going to die as well. So it's one that you may as well take it now, harvest it, see what we can do with it. Now, it has a bend in it about four and a half feet off of the ground that I'm not happy with. But from there on up, it is a very straight stick of a good diameter. So we're going to take that, harvest that, and see if it'll make a good hiking stick. You know, that's one of the things I've discovered about uh, estimating the size of a tree when it's still standing upright is uh, I always underestimate just how long it is. So I cut out the piece or the full length of piece that was straight enough to use and discovered it's eight, nine feet tall. So it's much longer than I need. But as I mentioned, don't be too quick to cut it down to length. You want to make sure that you have length to work with and so you can choose where you want to cut it off eventually. So even as I process this and debark it and everything else, I'll bring it closer to my final length, but I won't do my final length until, well, well, well after it's dried, just to make sure I don't get any checking on the ends, as we'll, we'll talk more about in a few minutes or in a little while. And uh, yeah, I don't need a nine foot piece of wood to carry out of the woods. So I'm going to take some more off of this, but I think I've got a pretty straight piece. A little bend here and there is not a bad thing. You get a little knot here where there was a branch coming out. That's not the end of the world. I'll be able to take that off because there's quite a bit of work to do to bring this into a really good hiking staff. But this is a good start. So this is plenty strong, plenty long, and uh, a little wider than the final diameter, which is, as again, as I recommend it, make sure that you get something a little wider and a little longer than you, than you think it's going to be when it's finished because uh, you will lose diameter to drying and debarking and sanding and whatever else you have to do to it. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit more off of this at the top because it's quite thick up there. And then we'll take it home and we'll take it on to the next step. All right, the next uh, step in processing your pole for turning it into a hiking staff is to remove the bark. And this is something you should do as soon as you can after getting it home. If it's a green stick, if it's a dry stick, uh, it's not going to matter so much. But you don't want the too much of the wood to dry out underneath the bark because it just makes it that much harder to get the bark off. The e it's easier while the stick is still somewhat wet. I remember we're in the middle of the winter, so it's going to be drier than it would be in the spring or summer. But uh, yeah, in any case, get the bark off as soon as you can. And then once we've done that, we're going to seal the ends up. But uh, I'll show you that in a minute. Now I am using my Tureva Scrama to do this. It's, uh, it's a good large knife. I like working with it. It'll make this job a lot easier. If I didn't have a knife this large, any reasonably good size bushcraft knife can do this. I guess even a Swiss Army knife could. It's just going to take you a lot longer to get it done. This will just expedite things. Plus I've got a few knots that I'm going to remove now. I could take a saw and remove them, but I'm going to remove, be able to remove them much easier. And yes, you could use a hatchet for this as well. The only thing I'd recommend is any big knife or any knife for that matter is to be cautious of where you're, how you're using the tool. You are going to be working somewhat close to your body. So make sure that the path of travel for the, uh, the cutting tool is away from your body. So let's get started. I find it easier than bending all the way down to the ground to have it on a stump. But there's uh, no special trick to this. Just get to work. If you've got a straight side, it makes it a little easier, but when you've got knots you have to work through this. Well, like I said, it's a good opportunity to, to remove them. It won't take too long to remove all the bark. 
And as I said, it's a lot easier to do it now than when it's dry. All right, so what I'll do is take a few minutes to remove the bark, and then I'll show you how we're going to seal the ends, and I suppose also why we're going to seal the ends. All right, I removed all the bark, and I've got it pretty much cleaned. Uh, it's worthwhile now taking a few minutes to clean as much as the cambrium or inner layer of the bark off as you reasonably can. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it's... Uh, if you leave it on, it's going to turn brown. It'll, it'll be easy enough to remove off, but and it's not going to stain the wood underneath. It just makes your job a little bit easier later the more you can remove right now. But uh, And I've done, well, it's cold out. I didn't do as good a job as I might have otherwise, but uh, it's done. It's Most of it's gone. Now, you don't have to do this, but I will tell you it'll make it a lot easier on you if you do it later, and that is to seal the ends of the pole. Now, I've left quite a bit of length on this pole, much more than I'm going to need for the finished product, so I will be cutting some off. So, But the point is, right now, I'm not sure which end I want to cut it off or some off of each end. But what I want to prevent from happening is checking splitting. A lot of the uh, moisture in the wood is going to want to come out the end of the poles. A lot better now that we've removed, removed the bark, but still the moisture will want to come out the ends. We want to slow that down because this is where the checking and cracking will occur, is on the ends of the pole. So there's a number of ways of doing it. I'm going to be using just a can of spray flex seal today, but in the past I've done things like just a little bit of latex paint, that house paint that I had on, around the house. I used wax for one project and for another project I just wrapped a little bit of saran around it and a couple of elastics. It's going to be on there for quite a while because it's going to take a while for the stick to dry to the point that you're ready to go on to the next step. But once again, if you can just put a little something on the end, it'll prevent that cracking and checking out here at the end of the wood, and you'll have more wood to work with at the end to get the right length that you want. All right, so all I'm going to do, spray a little on. And of course, flex seal is, can be a little messy, so there, that's enough for that end. Okay. I don't want it to run too far down on the side. There we go. So all I want to do now is do the same thing to the other end. I'm going to take this in the house once the flex seal is dry so I don't make a mess inside the house. And uh, it's going to take some time. I'll let you know how long it took, but it'll probably be a week or two before this is really ready to go on to the next step. All right, it's been a few weeks since we last worked on the hiking poles, longer than it was necessary for these to dry, but I wasn't any, in any rush to complete them, so I just let them dry a little longer. The longer you let them dry, maybe the better. So a couple things I've done since then. One was to cut it off to length, and it's not quite the final length. It's still a little tall, but that's intentional because as I work down the pole, I may decide that I want to cut a little bit more off of one end or the other, and I'll show you the reason why. It has a lot to do where the balance point will be when I carry the stick through the wood. You'll notice that I do have a, another hiking pole with me. This is another one I cut after I cut this one. Uh, this is a different tree. This is striped maple, or what we refer to as moose maple, and I just liked it. it was a little straighter than the one we cut out in the woods. However, this is still going to work for this project. All right, so a couple of things that I wanted to show you. One, you can see, let's see if I can't get this to focus properly that there is no checking or cracking in the ends of the wood and that has a lot to do with the fact that I sealed it off uh, before I let it dry so there weren't going to be any splits running down it. The other thing is you can see as you look at it there's still some of the inner cambrium bark left on it. That's what that brown area is. So I've got quite a bit to take off now. Uh, I could have worked a little harder, a little bit more diligently to get it off during the prep phase. But one of, one of the other things knots. So knots started to, actually you can see a little bit of the green bark there, knots started to appear under the bark that weren't as visible, like this little guy right here. They are not an issue, if they're not too large that is, they're not an issue for overall strength and stability to the pole. They do didn't tend to make it a little bit more difficult for doing finish work, but not all that much. Okay, so what I want to show you at this time is the tools that I brought out with me today to start working on these poles, to taking them down to a more finished uh, straightness and smoothness and we'll talk a little bit about that. So let me get those tools 
So how far you want to go with the finishing process is entirely up to you. Uh, I quite like having a very smooth hiking pole. Uh, we'll talk about things that you can do with the pole once you've finished the basic work in terms of decorations. But functionally, a smooth pole works well for me. I don't even wrap my poles anymore. I like the smoothness. We'll talk about the finish. They still grip well for me and they slide through my hand without any resistance. So I like to go down a long ways. Now, if it's an expedient hiking pole, you don't have to do any of this. I mean, you can stop the moment you cut it from the tree. You don't even have to remove the bark. But if you're looking to make something that will last you long term and look good, something you're proud of, take the time to work at it. How far, again, how far you want to take it down? Well, when we get finish the, the filing, we're going to be moving over to sandpaper, but we'll talk about that in a little while from now. So what am I doing now? I'm using my foreign hand, again, to work on all those areas. where knots and projections are out. Let's see if I can get up a little bit better in the camera. Again, here is that side I mentioned where it's a little bit uh, of a curve. Now, I'm not gonna be able to remove this entirely because there's not enough wood remaining, but I can at least take it down. and smooth it off so that there's less of a zigzag here. That's something I wish I had seen when I first got it. Here's a good spot right here to work on. There's a big knot. Oh, word of advice, do this outdoors. Don't do this indoors because it makes an incredibly fine dust and it seems to stick to everything when you're doing this. So uh, yeah, and that's even more important when we get to the sanding phase. Yes, do this outdoors. But at a bare minimum, you're gonna to wanna to use some type of a tool and you could use the back of a knife or a scraper to get rid of all that brown cambrium bark off of the outside. Uh, it works well to use it with this, but it's not the only tool you can use. This does leave scratches or grooves in the wood that you're gonna to have to sand out. So if you're not looking for an extremely flat, smooth finish, then maybe you don't wanna use anything this rough. You're just gonna use something like a sharp edge on the back of a knife just to scrape down all the cambrium off before you start moving over to sandpaper. All right, this takes time and uh, I'm not gonna make, me, make you watch me do it, but it'll be some time before I'm satisfied with just how far down it will have to go before I'm ready to start my sanding. All right, so it's been some time, probably about a week or two since the last episode where I began work on the hiking pole using the Forum One RASP file. Uh, I actually, I should point out that I moved over to working exclusively, at least for now, on the striped maple pole. I, I, I just felt that it had the best success or the best chance of success getting a relatively straight pole that I could finish for the video in a reasonable amount of time. I'll keep the other pole, the one we cut down in the woods, and I'll work on that later. But I think I can show you everything that I wanted to just still working on this pole. So once again, I used the rasp to take the thickness down, remove all the odor bark, smooth out any divots that were in it, and a few other things. Let me give you a couple close-ups. This is what it looks like after you've worked on it for, with the rasp for a while. Uh, it does leave it very rough with a lot of grooves in it. I did round the top off a little more than I've done on other sticks uh, for reasons we'll explain later. So uh, I took the time. I feel fairly comfortable now that it's at a thickness and a length that I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is sanding. There's just no way of getting around it. Now it depends all, of course, how finished you want it to look. I want mine to look quite finished. It's not going to be a lot of a, you know, carving or anything else in it, but it's going to be very smooth. And when we get to the finished part, I'll explain why I like it that way. But the next step is just to start with the, the coarsest sandpaper I have, which is a 60 grit. And I'll work my way up to, well, this one is 220 grit. I'll decide then if I'm going to stop there. I have often gone up to 350 and up to 400. And again, it's entirely up to you. But when I get the sanding done, before we move on to the finishing phase, I will come back and I'll show you a few other things that I'm going to do with the stick. All right, folks, in full disclosure, I jumped ahead a little bit just to save some time for the video, but I'm going to show you what it is I did, why I did it, and how I did it. So if you want to duplicate it for yourself, you can. So in the last segment, I said I would take the time to go down through the grits of sandpaper until I was satisfied with the finish on the outside of the staff. So I worked my way down to a 320 grit sandpaper, and I feel that's as fine as I need to go, maybe not even necessary to go down 
that far, that far down. But anything finer than that in the sandpaper probably won't make a difference once you get the boiled linseed oil on and tongue oil on, which I'll explain why a little later. So the finish, I think, is as far down as I want. Now, it's not perfect. I find that there are some imperfections in the staff that I really can't do anything about. It's mostly around the knots. There are some divots here and there that I just couldn't get rid of. But I think once again, once I get the boiled linseed oil on, that I'm probably not even going to notice them. Functionally, it's certainly not going to make any difference. So I'm ready now to move on to the next step of oiling the staff off. But I wanted to show you what I've done. So a couple of things. One is you can see, and I'll just try to get my face out of it so it'll focus. I've rounded over the top considerably. It's almost a full rounded top. Other staffs that I've made have been flatter on top. And the reason I did do did that is because I find when I'm going down uh, steep inclines and I'm using the stick to uh, as a support going down, it's a lot more comfortable in the palm of my hand if it's rounded like that. So that's one reason. Another reason, of course, is that if I'm using this in the center of a tarp as a pole to hold a tarp up, the rounded edge makes it a lot less likely that I'm going to do any damage to the to the tarp itself. Now, the other thing I did right here, as you probably already noticed, is I cut a groove into it. And I'll show you how I did that in a moment. So there's a groove cut into this point on the stick, very near to the top, about an inch and a half down. Another groove cut in right down here at about seven inches from the bottom. And those two grooves serve a really interesting function. I had mentioned in the opening of this video how the staff could be used for foraging by attaching a Y branch on, reaching up and grab it onto things. Um, that's one of the primary things, but anything that you want to attach to this, including a guy line for a tarp or a tent, it helps if there's somewhere for that rope to hold onto the stick. So that's the reason why I did this. Now you can put as many or as few of these as you want on your stick, as you may think will come in handy to you at a later time. I decided just to put two on. They're not so deep that they're going to affect affect the structural integrity of the stick, but they're in places where I've found from experience they can be useful for attaching it on. Now, probably for this one, this makes a good attachment point for a lanyard. Not that I use lanyards very much, but it is nice to have a lanyard already attached, and then I don't have to attach one if I want to use it for an extension, as I mentioned earlier. So I'll show you how I did that right now. And what I did is, in order to get a straight line on the stick, is I took a piece of masking tape, drew a line across it with a ruler and a pen, wrapped it around the stick at the point where I wanted to cut the groove so that the line overlapped itself. And that provided me a guideline in order to get a straight cut all, all the way around. After that, I used the saw on my Swiss Army knife to very slowly work my way around so that I didn't jump offside. And I worked right through the tape until I created a bit of a start of a groove, something that would uh, be able to catch the next tool I'm going to sew. So that's one way of doing it. Alternatively, and I did this for one of the two grooves, is I used a triangular file for the same purpose. I found this actually, this actually had a lot of control in that I could work my way along that pen line and work around the staff to create an initial groove. Once I had that groove created, I used this round file. Now this happens to be a chainsaw a sharpening tool, which is basically a small, very fine round file. And that's what I used to finish that groove off. And I went as deep as I felt was necessary just to be able to hold a piece of rope on. So there are uh, probably other ways this could have been done. These were just tools I had handy and that uh, allowed me to do it quite effectively. I'm actually very happy with that, how that turned out. Now, the last thing I'll show you is I, uh, created a notch on the end of the stick. So you can see, and again, I'll bring this up nice and close, get my face out of the way so it'll focus. So you can see now it looks a little rough and you'll, you'll see why, but the, it is a perfectly squared off shoulder. So I want to be able to put a, some type of a tip on the bottom end of my staff. And I've tried a few things over the years and then I started looking at the ones that you can buy commercially, which are really quite nice. They're made of brass, have carbon, tungsten tips on them and everything, or and then you can exchange that out for a rubber tip depending on what your surface is. And they're, they're really nice and I might like to have one, but I thought I didn't, if I don't have to spend that money, can I come up with something that I can do myself? So here's what I've come up with. So this is a 
end cap, a copper end cap used in plumbing. This is a three quarter inch end cap. I've got another one here already over to the bag. A three quarter inch end cap. And what I did is um, I did drill a hole in the bottom and I just started with a little dimple and then uh, a metal, a metal uh, drill bit. Uh, you really don't need it. Copper is very soft. You probably don't need any special drill bits for that. And what I did with that is I measured down from the top. Hopefully I can do this again without getting my face in the picture. Get there. How about that? So I measured down from the top and that's where I put the line around the outside. Again, using the same technique of using the tape with the uh, pencil or the pen line on it so I can get a round curve. And then used my saw and worked my way in around the edge. And then actually I just used the knife blade on my Swiss Army knife to start pulling the wood off until I got to a point where this wood slide down and rest perfectly on that shoulder. Now it is not snug, but it is fairly snug. It's not gonna fall off right now, but there is another thing I'll be doing to it. So you can see I've got almost a near perfect fit. You do have to do a little sanding to bring the outside of it down to where it is very close. Then with that hole on top, I was able to start another hole with a drill into the end of the pole itself. And I'll show you how this all goes together because the last thing I'm going to be doing is for a uh, hard point on the bottom of the staff is this is a concrete screw. Again, I'll get my face out of the way so that'll focus in on this, hopefully. There, this is a concrete screw that you can purchase. This one is an inch and a quarter, I believe. And they are of a hardened metal and covered already, as you can see. That So I'll be able to, once I get the cap on the end, I'll be able to screw that down through the hole. And this is what it'll look like on the bottom of the staff. So uh, again, I'll get my face out of the way so it'll focus. On focus there. Hopefully, I think that's coming in relatively clear anyway. And I've done this on a couple of the other hiking staffs that I have, and what it provides me is a very short grip on ice or wet surfaces so that it seems to dig right in like a cleat into the ice. And it's it's been absolutely great with very little to almost no wear. Actually, I think I can show you. This pole, the one that I started this video off with, is now, I believe, almost four years old. Again, get my face out of the way. And you can see that the tip has actually very, very little wear on the end of it. Now the copper is getting all scratched up from hitting the, con not concrete, the granite rock, which we seem to have more of than anything else in the woods here. So that's my intention is to do exactly the same thing here. Now I will be attaching this with an epoxy glue. I find uh, the epoxy glue is almost like a, uh, a forgiving thing. It covers up any mistakes that you might make, but it'll fill up all the gaps inside of that end cap so that uh, when you're finished, it'll be well affixed. I'll have a little bit of epoxy glue down in the end hole, and then I'll be screwing this in on top of that, and it'll fit right in, and it'll be a permanent affixture on the end of this. Actually, I don't know how permanent it is. Maybe you can take it off. I haven't had the need over four years, so it's unlikely that I will ever have to take it off with any of these poles. Okay, now uh, that's what I've done, how I did it, and why I did it. In the next segment, I will have glued this on, and what I'll do then is I'll start applying the boiled linseed oil to the outside of this and tell you, uh, talk a little bit about that. All right, again, to save a little bit of time, I went ahead and did some of the work off camera, but I'll explain what it was I had done. So very simple. All I had to do after the last segment was to apply the finish to the hiking staff. Now that does take a little bit of time. And the way I like to do it is I'll start with boiled linseed oil that has been thinned out by mineral spirits or turpentine or something in a 50-50 ratio. And I'll apply a coat, let it dry, apply another coat and let it dry. Now the reason I thin it out with mineral spirits or turpentine is because it will soak further into the wood than it would without that being added. So it does take a little bit of time to for each application to dry enough before you can put the next, next application on. After a few days of it drying out, then I can go over the hiking staff with any fine sandpaper in the 400 grit area 
just to make sure it, it is smooth because sometimes the, the oil, when it dries, leaves little bumps on the outside. And when I'm happy that I've reached the smoothness as, that I can or that I want to on the outside of this, and then I'll start applying tongue oil. Now, tongue oil is a little bit different than linseed oil. And what I find is that it doesn't soak into the wood as much. It said, tends to sit on top of the wood a little bit more. And of course, because of the first couple uh, applications of linseed oil, it would, it is going to sit on top of the wood as well. But what I like about tongue oil is that it, uh, it, it provides a good, fa a fairly good gl high gloss finish to it. Not that that's really all that important, but it's a very hard, durable surface, more so, I think, than linseed oil is. It takes it a little longer to dry and harden, but once it does, I find it is much more weather resistant and much more durable overall. Now, there's a couple of other benefits to it as well. So you can probably see there's a little bit of darkening to the staff from the last segment and that was simply because of the linseed oil. Uh, uh, tongue oil really doesn't change the color of the wood too much. Now this is going to darken up over rage from sun exposure. That's just natural of course and probably once every year or so I'll put another thin application of tongue oil over it. Now here's the other thing I like about tongue oil. You'll notice that there is no wrappings, no carvings or anything down the shaft of this staff and that's because I think they actually get in the way of being grippy on here. So what I like about tongue oil, let's see if you can hear this. You should be able to hear my hand. So what I find is that the staff will slide freely through my hands if I allow my grip to open up a little bit. But the moment I need that real grip on it, if I grab, it's there and I don't have to worry about my hand slipping. And that's true regardless of the temperature. I find even in winter, that's still got that grippiness. And regardless if it gets wet, it just seems to remain grippy. But I like the fact that I can move the staff through my hand without any resistance because when I'm going up and down hills and over rocks, then I can readjust and reposition my staff as I need to. Okay, I think it's time for us to wrap this video up. It's been a little over time in the making, so I won't make it any longer than it already is. What I have done in the creation of the staff is to make something that is more functional than it is aesthetic in nature. It's not very artistic. At the same time, I think it looks pretty good. It's something I'm happy to have and show people when I'm out on the woods, and I have had people uh, notice these staffs. There are a lot of things I could have done to the staff. I could have done intricate carvings, honestly, I'm not that talented, but if you are, by all means, put the carvings on your staff. It makes it a little bit more personalized and, you know, just a little bit more you. Personally, I like to leave it plain for the reasons just mentioned so that my hand will move up and down it without any resistance. So everything I've done to the staff has been more on the functional side of things. Okay. This is the way I like to make my staffs. They're not the only way to make staffs, of course. There are a variety of ways, almost as many different ways as there are people who make them. So I'd be interested in knowing from you what you would do differently in the making of a hiking staff for yourself. What things that you would suggest that you think work well in a hiking staff and what things maybe you've done that you wouldn't repeat over again. Let's share that with everybody out there. And in the meantime, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.